Well, good afternoon, to everybody. Um, I'm Professor Brian Cunningham, serving as director of MNTL, and uh, my pleasure to welcome you to the uh, four seed uh, rollout and training. So I was invited to give a few um, opening remarks. Uh, first, happy Halloween. I hope you all have a chance to celebrate. I wore my crazy uh, Star Wars shirt today. I'm the only one. I feel kind of <laughs> <laughs> like, like a sore thumb. Uh, anyway, um, if you're thinking back to um, you know, several years ago, and very you know, grateful to um, Professor Clara Narstad, who um, you know, thought uh, enough about what was going on in this building over here across the way from CSL to, to wonder um, how um, you know, tools that um, they could develop with, with you know, the, the skills and you know, the talents of the computer science people could have an impact on the micro and nanofabrication research. And so uh, we, we had some you know, discussions with uh, myself um, and with uh, John Hughes, who is the clean room manager at MNTL uh, several years ago, uh, about some of the limitations that we face with the technologies and tools that we use for fabricating our devices. And so um, you know, now you know, we know that we're in the, the Internet age pretty firmly now. Uh, I think that we all know, you know that the cloud exists. Um, there are things that we can take advantage of. We use in our personal lives every day. I mean, we take a, a photo on our cell phone, and it's uploaded to all our other um, you know, you have Mac or Google devices, we can go see that or share it anywhere. Why couldn't we do the same kind of things here with the data that we take at MNTL? And so the, the thing that, that many of you are aware of, we have these um, you know, tools that generate data. Um, it could be in the form of images, could be in the form of you know, a, a thickness profile. Uh, but these uh, tools come from different vintages. Uh, they, they might have, um, have some uh, like old um, Windows version, you know, running the, the system. Um, it may be able to take images, but they can only be locally stored. Maybe you can burn them onto a CD, which, which is a technology several years ago. And so our, our thought was to uh, make the, the tools in the clean room um, able to communicate safely with the outside world. Uh, and that's, that takes some work to do that securely so we don't have Russian hackers coming in and stealing all, all our data, for example. Um, you know, you're going and things like this happen. Actually, people do um, seek to go wherever they can find information and take it for whatever purpose they may have. And so the university has a struggle with keeping these uh, old operating systems you know, secure. Uh, but then you know, also, um, you know, why, why couldn't we make you know, the data that we generate able to uh, share it, to, to curate it, to store it securely uh, so that um, you can share it with other students, you can share it with other groups you're working with here at Illinois uh, or at other universities, so your advisor could sit there at their desk and see it and take out images and data to uh, throw into their presentations. Um, and so th these are the reasons why we undertook this effort. And so um, now I'll say it, it has taken a lot of effort. Uh, to prepare a National Science Foundation proposal where these ideas were embraced pretty enthusiastically by NSF uh, because th they know that the problems that we face here are, are the same uh, at every other you know, research university in, in the country. And so um, as we develop tools here, um, we hope to um, you make them available more broadly. And it's just one of the ways that University of Illinois is a leader and has an impact on you know, many other parts of the world. Uh, and so you know, since you know, getting a National Science Foundation grant, um, there have been efforts on the part of, of students and staff here at MNTL to you know, communicate you know, the needs to develop these tools, to test them out, um, kind of culminating uh, now in our ability to share them with you. And so um, we, you know, the point of today and in future sessions is to uh, make you aware of the capabilities, to train you how to use them. We really hope to see uptake uh, and, and people using them. We, we've set up, we've spent a bunch of money too uh, to make uh, just many terabytes of storage available uh, so we can uh, fill these with our data. If we fill them, we'll come up with more storage. And, and so I, I see this as a tool that we'll you know, make use of for many years going forward. Just become you know, part of the research infrastructure that we you know, maybe we'll be taking for granted you know, 10 years from now, but without these efforts and without your participation, they won't go anywhere. So thanks so much for coming. Um, I hope you find it you know, useful and also give your feedback as you, um, you know, see these tools and their capabilities. You know, think about, oh, I wish it could do that. Or, you know, I did it this way and you know, I, I wish that we could tweak it and make it do something that it doesn't currently do. 
we're, we're here to get your feedback and to build these things into capabilities that future students here and all over the country will be able to take advantage of. So um, enjoy. So Professor Narstad. Uh, thank you, Brian, for uh, the introduction. And uh, uh, I'm Clara Narstad. I'm the director of Coordinated Science Lab, and I'm also PI of the uh, project uh, that I'm going to talk about. Uh, um, I would like to acknowledge some uh, crucial component uh, members uh, of this particular project uh, that you are going to be hearing uh, and also they are going to be actually uh, helping during the hands-on uh, session. First of all, Steve Constanti, uh, they, uh, then Todd Nicholson and also uh, Fong Enjun. Uh, and I think Tarek uh, uh, El Gamal. Uh, those are the uh, uh, staff uh, researchers uh, that are uh, really building this particular system that we are going to talk about. And also, you will then hear uh, from the engineering IT. Uh, Stuart will present uh, some of the um, aspects of the system. Uh, needs and also Patrick uh, uh, Sue, who is currently here from MNTL, and I would like to thank all of them uh, for really making this workshop uh, possible. And of course, uh, Greg Pluta, that uh, who actually really made it possible within the MNTL. So thank you so much. Um, so now I'm going to uh, talk about a little bit about the system. Um, it's an NSF-funded project, and the major major goal for this project is to address scientific data. Uh, digital data acquisition, you take them from the microscopes and scientific curation, you go to your office and you want to curate and massage the particular data and share this particular data that uh, will be then uh, uh, shared with your uh, group mates or with your advisor and maybe later on with the collaborator and this is all prior to you actually doing uh, scientific publication. So it's a private cloud storage. Uh, um, you might recognize some of the uh, particular workflows. The major aspects that we understood as computer scientists uh, were that you are going actually through major workflow uh, and uh, use many, many different uh, uh, equipment and data uh, come from these different equipment as you are currently following your recipe and developing either new materials or new semiconductor uh, devices. So you currently can see that data are coming from various types and in multimodal formats, you will basically gain over your particular session with the uh, experimental equipment uh, um, images. You will um, take notes uh, in order to uh, uh, keep what is the oxygenation depth or what is the oxygenation layer composition, or you might actually want to take uh, notes uh, what is currently the time that your particular experiment was taking, temperature and, the, and pressure under which particular data, uh, the, the material was be exposed. So there's a lot of, lot of data and metadata that you are collecting. Um, we basically want to create a uh, data cyber infrastructure uh, to actually allow you easily to uh, store this particular data method, organize it, manage it, and then search for it. So many, many different functionalities that I think will speed up your time uh, and your processing uh, uh, of this digital domain. So what um, we actually are building uh, uh, with the uh, co coordination of MNTL researchers like Patrick, previously Tommy O'Brien, and then various lab managers, and as well as in MRL, is a uh, system that has a component at the microscope level. That's actually your uploader, right? That sits, that's in the PC that currently runs uh, your particular microscope, but there basically is also software for seat client that actually allows you uploading function so that you can like drag and drop actually their, your data and then write, sort of uh, annotate data and you will hear more about that and play with that um, what the, what during the uploading phase you can do. And then actually you go 
either on your laptop, even during the session, or you go to your office or somewhere else on the campus, you log into the four seat cloud and then you get a curator client uh, connecting to that particular um, server, to that particular um, four seat cloud. And there actually you can access your data, you can massage it, you can search through the metadata, particularly if you have uh, collected gigabytes of data through a couple of months uh, and you want to organize that particular data. It allows you very, very nicely uh, to do that. Um, so um, as uh, uh, Professor Cunningham sort of mentioned, uh, we actually now have the cloud infrastructure. The four seat production service is here. Um, we put together all our funds from MNTL, MRL, and uh, from the NSF uh, uh, funding and purchased 80 terabytes facility where currently that particular cloud uh, your client will sit on your laptops, right? Or in the PC next to the microscope. But um, uh, the cloud consists of two major components. One is the storage component that has the disks, the 80 terabytes of disks. And then it actually gets connected via 10 giga, uh, gigabit uh, connection to a uh, cloud computing uh, uh, server that currently has very, very high speed processing. And the reason is that the data uh, you basically want to analyze, you want to visualize, you want to search for it, you want to do some computation, extract metadata out of the images. So um, the uh, cloud infrastructure consists of these two, cloud storage and cloud uh, compute. Um, one really important uh, uh, design aspect for this cloud infrastructure is that we want very high reliability. And that means that we basically are going to allocate to MNTL and MRL 40 terabytes. And the 40 other terabytes stay as a replication so that if some of the disks go down and for, for some un unforeseen reason your data might uh, basically get lost, we don't want that. We will replicate that as you are creating data and storing on the cloud, it's immediately going to get replicated to another set of 40 terabytes disk so that if one part of that particular service goes, we immediately switch to another 40 terabytes replicated data and you can continue your work seamlessly as long as we are repairing the other 40 terabytes of space. So that's really important aspect. Second important aspect is that we have designed this particular cloud so that it's extensible. Professor Cunningham basically mentioned that, well, you might maybe get at the beginning 20 gigabytes. Uh, let's go, everybody gets as an account 20 gigabytes to sort of store data. But at some point we might run out of space as MRL and M MNTL basically are uh, taking more and more data and you are doing more experiments, you don't throw as much data away. And so we actually designed the compute part of the cloud and the storage part that it gets enhanced. You can buy new uh, storage disks, you can buy new compute servers, uh, servers that create the cloud and uh, basically it can work very seamlessly. So it's very extensible. As you can see, there is a future expansion that we can buy more cores and buy more disks. So that's actually very, very important aspects. Um, so um, uh, we are looking for redundancy, availability, scalability. Uh, those are truly the design uh, uh, goals. Um, it has very lightweight, very fast response time uh, uh, because we actually do go in the compute layer with Docker containers, orchestration by Kubernetes, and single master. So um, um, truly very much uh, uh, the particular uh, goals is response time, that you don't wait forever as you are currently uploading or you are curating the data. Yeah. The connection between your clients and your cloud, currently there is a direct connection. If you are sitting on the, uh, an, at the microscope that currently runs Windows 7 or newer or some of the sort of newer sort of operating systems. However, we just got a grant this year from National Science Foundation and we are building a uh, uh, so-called edge device um, to actually connect 
order instruments. We know that in MNTL you have also instruments that are running now, Windows NT, Windows XP, uh, and older. And so we designed an architecture and the software and hardware that basically will sit between the PC at the instrument and your four-seat cloud data storage and compute storage, which uh, will allow you to seamlessly drop box to or upload basically data to your four-seat storage without you noticing it, but uh, basically it will protect you that no viruses can go to the older operating systems and older devices. The reason that we need that edge device um, is that it's called Cloudlet um, and the project is called Bracelet. Um, the reason we need these devices is because your operating systems on the old instruments, Windows NT, Windows 2000, and so on, they cannot be patched. And that means that your older instruments are currently very security pr um, uh, attack prone. So uh, that's currently in work, and we hope by um, the spring, basically, to have a uh, first version of implementation and testing in the Siebel Center, uh, and then actually we will start sort of do testing. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, major two functions from, for you as users are uploading service. There is a very simple sort of interface that you will be actually experimenting with uh, to basically drag the particular um, data in, uh, into your foreseed account. Uh, there is, uh, you will also have an opportunity to actually use either templates. Patrick will talk about the templates and recipes, how you can capture uh, your processes as you are currently doing, uh, and also adding metadata that you, under which currently you are uh, working, and those are all the data that you, um, in the prior life, have been keeping in a paper notebook, right? So the goal is currently really to put it into the digital domain. And the same thing on the curation side, what uh, you come to your office, you upload the particular data and metadata, and then actually you will get interfaces to visualize all your data, name your data, search through your data, as you would be on an eBay, right? Basically, uh, Professor Cunningham mentioned that uh, you as young people are all used to uh, the, the everyday life to use all kinds of sort of cloud services for purchasing of your goods, Amazon books and so on. We want that kind of sort of feel and interface to your scientific data. And so it's, da it's dashboard management. You can manage your data much more efficiently, preview, annotate, download, extract sort of metadata. Um, and one important aspect that is very different to what you have in Dropbox is uh, when you go into Dropbox or Google Drive, you get a very flat sort of uh, long names that are capturing all your metadata information, file names, and that's basically where your data is currently stored. Here currently you upload them and you can have very high level type of names, but a lot of the uh, other knowledge about metadata is stored in the metadata uh, fields that you can immediately see. And the data gets actually very nicely organized in the hierarchical uh, collection data sets and files um, so that you have a better understanding what happened. You can actually sort of have the data, what happened on a particular instrument as you have this plasma etching or uh, dialectical removal or oxygenation, and under that you can then store all kinds of sort of, if it's a calibration or real uh, calibration, and then under that you can have then data and metadata in tech file, TIFF file, and so on. So you will see that actually as you are going through the data. So the, um, uh, to summarize, I want to sort of uh, give enough time uh, for everybody else, is uh, we have a website, um, and uh, you are actually, we have uh, flyers that I will distribute once I am done, um, and uh, you can extract metadata, store the data. Um, this particular service is all maintained by engineering IT, so don't worry if uh, sort of the grant expires, this is going away. We want to actually continue this particular service, um, and you can search for data and metadata, analyze, visualize, an easy sharing between your advisor can have an account or can, you can allow access to your own account and that particular advisor can look at the data, visualize it jointly or with your particular group. 
So many advantages, one-stop location, uh, shareable between you and uh, everybody else that you mean uh, to, uh, to see the data, visual interpretation of data, um, cloud-based, um, you can access the data from anywhere. Um, basically, we, will, we have an authentication, very strong authentication to get to that particular resource, uh, the cloud, so you can be sure that it's secure, uh, accessible. And we have replications, uh, um, uh, basically, machine-specific metadata on measurements are provided for future replications of measurements. So that's actually also a very, very important aspect, and Patrick will talk about that. So um, as I mentioned, we partnered with engineering IT and um, uh, basically have uh, uh, a lot of educational materials. Tommy O'Brien, who was a student here, created a very nice video. We are going to put more educational materials. A lot of the materials we talk about today will be put uh, on uh, Foreseed or on MNTL website, wherever basically currently you want us uh, to advertise, and it's available. So we are hoping at the end of this particular uh, training session that you will have accounts and you will start uh, really working uh, with the, and use this particular resource for your research. Okay. So I'm Stuart Turner, a uh, senior IT specialist with engineering IT, and I am the uh, primary research support for MNTL. Some of you in the room probably recognize me. Um, so how does this sort of relate to you guys? How is this going to help you? Uh, I'm kind of going to outline what the current situation is in the clean rooms and the bio lab and some of the other research labs here. Um, first, some of the challenges with data management. Um, uh, as Clara mentioned earlier, there are a lot of insecure operating systems currently running in the clean rooms, the bio nano lab, and probably in some of the other research labs. Uh, Windows XP and older, Windows 2000, 95, 98, we kind of run the gamut in the building as to what we have uh, currently running. Um, most of these operating systems aren't being patched. They don't get security updates. and so. Because of that, they are considered vulnerable to malicious attacks, which uh, some of you may be aware of. Our campus is sort of under siege from outside forces quite often. So if we used to have like Windows XP and older on the open network, and that caused some problems from a security standpoint. Um, some of these operating systems don't even have full networking capabilities. They don't actually run the TCP IP stack. So uh, we are working on what we will do to address those really old machines, but mostly today we're going to speak on the Windows XP, Windows 2000, 95, down to Windows 311, I believe, still has TCP. Um, so some of them have lack of network. There it goes. Um, the networking status is um, they are either offline completely in the clean rooms and other lab spaces due to uh, some of you may remember in 2013. Uh, we had an, a mandate from campus to pull all Windows XP machines and older off of the open network. Uh, so they were either completely unplugged from the network or put on a custom private network that cannot talk to anything outside of campus. Uh, that's where most of the XP and older uh, currently live. Uh, so that sort of uh, causes some problems when it comes to trying to access cloud resources. Um, the other concern is inconsistent research group resources. Uh, some research groups may have on-campus file shares where you can upload your data to a file share or to a remote server. Some groups don't. And so we were sort of treating this as kind of a ground floor. We're sort of assuming that the groups don't have any access to file shares on campus currently. Um, the current upload availability, uh, yeah. Um, is file shares and cloud storage, which anything running Windows 7 and newer has access to, your Dropbox, your Box, um, those sorts of things. Um, and some tools don't have access to that. Some tools don't have access to, to Dropbox, which is technically hosted off campus. The same with Box, even our U of I Box is an off campus resource, which means we can't really access it from anything that's on the private networks. Um, USB keys, that's kind of one of the other solutions a lot of people have been working with, and these have their own security concerns. Uh, one, if you don't know where the USB key originally came from, there could be malicious code living in the USB key, and some of these older OSs don't have the protections built into them to protect from malicious code just running as soon as you plug in. 
there, you, there are even some USB keys out there in the wild that when you plug them in, they can actually damage the hardware itself. Um, they can do a feedback of uh, the voltages that will actually kill motherboards. Um, so USB keys, which is one of the common things for some of these older machines, uh, has its own hazards as well. So that's not really a sustainable solution for us. Looking forward, the reason why we're kind of looking at this right now is Windows 7 is fine for the moment. Um, come in 2020, about midway through 2020, Windows 7 is going to be pulled from support by Microsoft, which means security patches for Windows 7 will stop working like Windows XP went through in 2013. So we're trying to sort of get ahead of the curve because we know there's a lot of Windows 7 devices out there in the building that may or may not be upgradable to Windows 10 or newer. And so we want to make sure that we have something in place for when Windows 7 does fall out of support, we already have a solution in place and we can shunt everything over and your, uh, your interface will not be um, interrupted. So your workflow will stay pretty much the same. A couple other concerns we have been seeing, and this uh, goes a lot to the older hardware, is hardware does fail. Hardware does die over the course of years. Even in an environment such as a clean room or a highly protected space, the hardware is going to have a shelf life. Um, hard drives are one of the biggest ones that generally dies, and if that's where all of your data is stored, and that dark drive dies and we haven't had any place to upload it, then your data may be lost, and there's only so much we can do to uh, recover some of that. So this is another way of sort of protecting against data loss and research uh, data issues. Um, so that's kind of a brief overview of the current situation. So now I'll hand it off uh, for, oh yeah, you're using your own laptop, right? Uh, for what we are looking at for the future to get 4C working in the cloud, in the labs and in the clean rooms. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Patrick Sue, and uh, some of you may know me. I'm part of Professor Dallas Hassey's group. Uh, I think I've seen a couple of you in the clean room. And so as a MNTL user and ultimately clean room user in this uh, facility, I was brought on to the four seed project to basically give design uh, advice and to basically make this cloud uh, storage software not just your traditional Google Drive, Dropbox, but something that we can actually use because I've seen a couple of you and you probably guys are in the same position as me. When we store up recipes or load SEM images, they're just all over the place. We're trying to use a cloud storage program that's not meant to be used the way that we want it. And that's what 4Seed is here to basically help fix. And so for this workshop, I'm going to first present, let's see if this will go here. <coughs> For the first off, I'm going to present a couple of key features of 4 seed. Now, there's a bunch of features I can't really go through all of them in the time that have been given, but a couple of key features I think are the most important that you guys will love to use in 4 seed. And then I'll talk about a couple of practical usage cases that we've used 4 seed in our group to help expedite uh, process analysis, help keep storage of different device fabrication flows and data results. And then we'll go into basically a live demo with a little bit of lunch so you guys can help and play around with 4 seed. And then you can see whether or not you like it. Hey Patrick? Yes. Just real quick. Um, if you're off campus, you will have to VPN in order to use 4C. So. All right. So going into the couple of key features, um, the first one that I'll talk about is basically metadata and template. So metadata is essentially just your key values of parameters. If I'm at the plasmon free on RIE, I want to use the uh, select gases, the power, uh, the pressure, and as well as keep track of what power that I'm using. All of this data is typically stored in a .txt file if you're at the computer in the clean room. And then when you try to go and look it back up, it's kind of cumbersome to compare different recipes because you're just downloading .txt files. Here I'm going to show basically that template formatting can help keep your information concise consistent, uniform across all different uh, fabrication flows and procedures. And this becomes especially important not when you're just looking at it, but when other group members, including your PI, is looking at it. Because everyone has a different own recipe base of just even just storing data. You know, I might have one way of saying, hey, I'm going to put all my gases in my power flow and I'm going to give my comments. Tommy O'Brien, my previous mentor, he might have a different way of going about it. He might say, well, I'm going to list only the few parameters that are important and then just chuck all of the rest because I already know it. 
this already gives you a way to unif uh, to give a more uniform structure that your group members can look at. Then I'm going to talk about file sharing in group spaces. Now this is especially important because people, this is a live update feed of how your group process is going. Say you have basically a senior member who is updating X recipes or deposition recipes and they want to broadcast it to the whole group. Instead of tracking down every single group member and going through every single clean room notebook and saying, hey, change this parameter from say 20 SCCM to 10 SCCM and gives you a better profile, you can automatically just tell them, hey, go to 4 c look at this new recipe, and they'll already have the most updated parameters to date because it's all digitalized and cloud-based. And so, going off of uh, the metadata template, again, what we have here is basically all, I've already made this super easy for everyone, is that when you sign up for Forsyth today, you basically get all of these templates for all of the most commonly clean room tool used. So this includes the Tryon Minilog PCV, the SDS CVD, both Oxford, ICPRAs, even lithography standard and image reversal, all ready for you to go. So all you have to do is punch in those key values and then you can look them up in uh, basically what are called data sets and refer to them very easily and share them to your group members. And this makes it, again, into a uniform and concise format that is also searchable. Now, what I mean by searchable is that when you're looking at a clean room notebook through traditional use, if I have maybe you know, five to seven clean room notebooks usage from like past members of my group, that's not really that helpful, even though they would say, oh yeah, just go look it up, it's already there. To sift through five to seven clean room notebooks finding one etch recipe that I may or may not know is useful is actually quite more difficult than it sounds. And this allows you to easily just search up a keyword search, maybe you know diffusion 500 degrees C, and it'll pull up all the results that you'll need that have diffusion at 500 degrees C. And you can look for yourself, whether it's pertaining to a certain device structure or it's pertaining to a different fabrication flow, you'll be able to compare and contrast those different experiments quite easily rather than looking through all of your clean room notebooks. And so this brings me to, again, going into group space. Now this, we're trying to basically have group spaces managed by PIs. So once the lead senior member of your group leaves, who is typically your admin manager of these spaces, say if you're on Google Drive or Dropbox, you don't have to continue you know, switching user uh, privileges or you know, ownership of these different spaces because they'll already be part of your PI's group space. And what we imagine is that PI's essentially own this group space so it lives as long as the group is there. And students are just consistently added on to that and they can contribute their data in there and for the PIs especially, this makes it easy for you to know what's happening in your group real time. If you need any data or, you know, uh, say LIV curves, X recipes, processing flows, they are all readily available for you when you need to uh, submit to a conference or make a presentation or even write up a proposal. All of that data is ready for you, ready to go. And this again provides an easy way to uh, visualize all your data because all we really need is basically a profile SCM or optical microscope image along with the parameters given and you are running off to the races with basically whatever you're doing. Because typically when you look at a clean notebook, all I see is a bunch of uh, different scribbles of basically, oh, here's my X recipe this day, here's my X recipe that day. But when I'm updating that, I sometimes don't get all of it all together. Sometimes I have you know, part of it working correctly on one page, and then I have to flip three pages later to find out, oh, well, I altered this parameter you know, five days later to make it work today. So this allows you to have it all in one easy place that's easy to visualize where your uh, process is at and what the profile is uh, resulting. So you might already be using you know, Dropbox or Google Drive, and that's still okay because we can transition you very easily to 4 -C. We currently have a single record user of using our file extractor, which basically all you have to do is download all of your Google Drive files and then just upload it into our zip uploader. 
And so we can even handle up to 30 gigabits from, uh, sorry, 30 gigabytes of data from a previous user, and it might take you a little while. Um, I think it took a couple of uh, tens of minutes to upload it, but you can get all of your uh, files uploaded into Foreseed, and it also preserves not only just the data file format, include proprietary format, so this is your SEM images, or some of you say the ellipsometer or alpha step out readings, this also keeps all of the hierarchy that you put under it. So everything is the same when you look at it in Foreseed, and you are allowed to search and also analyze it straight using Foreseed. So now that I've gone through a couple of the key features that I think are most important, I'm going to give a couple of usage cases that uh, our group has found the most uh, useful. So the first one is, again, that I've been stressing a lot, is keeping fabrication flow. When you're starting a new device, you want to be able to look at the whole uh, flow of the device while giving such a very concise, easy format, such as the picture on the right. Gives you an SEM image with all the parameters you need. But this also can be used for training or ramp up of newer students. Say you have newer students who have never seen lithography, deposition, or etching before. To describe this in such a way that they'll understand is kind of a bit difficult. I still kind of remember the first time that Tommy was taking me through, say, you know, at the liner through lithography, and he's like, all right, now look at the left. Do you see the alignment marks? And I'm saying, I see a lot of things on the left. You're going to have to be a bit more specific. So this allows you, as uh, basically a newer student, to see how, what you expect when you have mesa lithography. So as a newer student, if I'm in 4C, I can go to my mesa lithography, look at all of the X recipes, saying I need a spinning at 3,000 K, I need you know, a spinning time of say 80 seconds or something or other. And then you're able to see what you expect out of your experiment. So instead of me going blindly in, spinning, you know, developing, finally etching, and then go taking, look on an optical microscope and taking an image and giving it to Tommy and say, hey, is this correct? I can easily troubleshoot myself by giving a visual data visual representation of what it's supposed to look like as a thumbnail at the end. And this also kind of allows you to visualize how your process is going. If I'm looking at an X recipe and I, was, I just write down lithography, then I want definition and then stripe planarization, unless you've been doing this for a long time, you don't exactly really know what that means on a visual perspective. These thumbnails facilitates that and gives a better ramp up time for newer group members. The second use that I've been stressing a lot is the search function for process analysis and failure diagnostics. Say, again, you have a uh, failure mode where you have, it looks like bait polymer in the middle of your surface and you don't know why. Again, you could either A, go to the vendor and try to figure out why your uh, polymer is over baking, or you can try going to a group member who will probably refer you to their notebooks and say, good luck trying to find it. What we've actually found pretty useful was that once we start storing all of our information into Forsy, you can easily search it up. You can just say base polymer, and if you add the right descriptors, because you're constantly commenting on what you upload to make sure you know what that experiment happened, you can say, oh, I already had this beforehand. And this was, this was my case, but Tommy had this beforehand, and he said, oh, I accidentally had to, my first recipe was a bake temperature of, say, 600 C, but you should actually bring that back down to a 500C diffusion, otherwise you'll just completely overbake your polymer, and that ends up uh, fixing your failure mode. And if you imagine, the longer your group uses 4C, the longer and more uh, information you have to search from. So say five students from now, say five generations of students from now, those students can still look up the old generation of students and look at what their data has, instead of just having notebooks lying around there that won't ever be opened ever again. And lastly, again, it's device archiving. Being able to look at past devices with past fabrication flows in such an easy way that has also visual representation. You can separate them and say, I have a couple, so these are actually my devices here. You can separate them into practice samples, into just purely simple experiments that you were trying to go for. And this, the most important part is that 4Seed is actually here already supported by engineering IT and the building itself. We've already invested 20 terabytes of space for all the users at MTL, so you have that initial buy-in already to use 4Seed. And so 
what I found the most useful, and this will depend on how you guys decide to use it, was that I've actually split my hierarchy in such a way that I call my spaces into groups and projects, my collections into devices experiments, and my data sets into my fabrication steps. And we'll let you guys basically kind of uh, play around a little bit with this during our demo since our demo now is basically going to be using the EC444 IC transistor uh, fabrication flow. So EC444 is a course here that's taught and given in our fabrication room and unfortunately I can't give you one of our device recipes otherwise Professor Dallas actually might have a few words with me. Um, but I can use the EC444 to show how you can easily use this to set up your own device fabrication, how you can search the results afterwards, and how you can keep it all under one concise uh, format. And so I want everyone who has a laptop right now to just go ahead and go to 4c.illinois.edu in your file explorer. And then we, uh, we can help sign you up um, for an account really quickly right now just so you guys can basically use the templates that I provided you. So like I said before, um, I've managed to spread out a template for all of the uh, most commonly used tools in MNTL. So if you're a clean room user in MNTL, I've always had all the gases, power, pressures, all the parameters, you name it, in that tool already uploaded for you. So all you have to do is go find your tool, enter your data set, click save, and that's already set up for you. And while you're doing that, I will go ahead and do it with you guys. So once you get to the uh, main page, this is what it should look like. So you guys are going to click sign up and please use your illinois.edu address. Since we are um, considering implementing a feature through Shibboleth that has that second authentication page. So sooner or later, I believe that we'll be requiring you to use an Illinois EDU address in order to log into Forseed. But for me, since I've already been using it, I'm just going to go into here, type in my email and my password, and then click login. So here already you can see a couple of uh, my devices. So for this, I'm going to create a space. <laughs> uh, you may, yes. So you can either create a space or you can just start off uh, making collections. Basically, um, the hierarchy of that 4 seed base is off of is the space is the top most one, then it goes into collections, and then it goes into data sets. So typically, if you want to share something, you can share anything from any of the hierarchies, but it's easier to just share space. Say you want to have some collaborators on this group, then all you have to do is basically add in different users to be able to access that space. And so just to, while you guys are basically setting up uh, your four seat account, since there is that double authentication, I'll just show you a couple of things that I've been using recently. So here we have uh, the shared space with our group space here, and we have a couple of data sets and collections here. But namely, let's see if I can go in here without giving you guys too much. So here we already have basically all of the users in there. So this would imagine be your group as well. We also have some previous users on this account, uh, Ben and Tommy, who have now graduated, but uh, we are still able to use this account because the lifetime is basically based off of Professor Dallas Hassey's account. And so you can keep on adding users, and you can also remove users. So say if you have industry collaborators, you can have them look at the data if they need to, and then remove them once that project is finished, so you preserve the integrity of your space. So for the purpose of this demo, I will go ahead and create a new space. And then I'm just going to go make this public. Most of the times, you guys will basically just make it private for your own reasons. And to make it searchable, all you have to do is add a couple of words, such as workshop or foreseed. And then you can use this search bar to basically find that result later if you ever want to. 
And so now, looking at looking at the uh, standard EC444 recipe, I'm just going to go through the first four steps. After that, it should be pretty intuitive how to do the other steps. Um, but for our purposes, since EC444 has different recipes and different uh, tools, but I want to show you how you guys can use the templates given here of the MNTL tools, I'll go ahead and use those templates to do the exact same as these. So the first step is an RCA clean. So what we want to do is, uh, before I start, does anyone have any issues so far as to signing up or getting to where I'm at? No? Okay. So right now, we're going to go through the standard uploader. In the future, uh, we'll just basically be able to do this through creating data sets. Um, however, right now, since we're that's still in almost into uh, final stages of development, we'll still use a standard uploader since this is a live page. So the first question is, do you want to put this in a shared space? And I'll click yes because that's where the MNTL 4 seed workshop is. And it basically now goes down to the next hierarchy, which is called the collections. Since there are no collections here, what I call my collections are basically my devices. So I'm just going to call this EC444 transistor IC. And you can put some descriptions here for uh, easy searching, but I'll just go ahead and create my collection, and then you can automatically click on this to move on to data sets. So creating a new data set immediately already has these template options. So you can either create a new template if you have basically a new tool or a new uh, process flow that you want to go off of. But for our purposes, we're just going to go to low template. Now you can either choose my template, which is basically all of my personal ones. So on top of the MTL ones that are shared, I have some personal templates. But we're just going to go through what you guys probably have. This is probably what you have, which is based off the global ones, just because you guys probably haven't created new templates yet. So since for our standard clean, our RCA clean, we're just going to go ahead and select standard decrease. Now you see a couple of options here. You have uh, the current uploader templates, such as the acetone methanol IPA, which is a very standard decrease procedure. Or if you want to add, say, maybe O2 clean at the end of it, you can add a new field, add in those parameters, and save it as is. So basically, you can basically use the template as is, or you can alter it depending on your specific application. So for the acetone, you can say like yes, simply Y, or just like no, and then you can create your data set. What, what template are you using right now? Uh, I am using the MNTL standard decrease. Okay. So that should be somewhere in the middle right there of where you have. And then we'll just call this the same as the EC4444, which is uh, standard RCA clean. And you can go ahead and add search uh, tags such as clean, um, etc. And then you can just go ahead and create it. And so what's also very useful, again, is the thumbnail images. And so you can go ahead, if you have any images, say you're on your phone and you take an image, you can basically go and upload that through uh, this browser here. So I've already downloaded a couple of images, so if you have, say this is your wafer clean, and you want to upload that, you can hit submit. And then once you go to that collection, you can see already that I have a thumbnail of my image, I can go into my RCA clean, and I can go into my metadata and find what I just uploaded. So this is what your final goal is basically trying to have for your fabrication. You're trying to keep track of all your parameters and your process flows while being able to have a corresponding image that helps the user understand what's going on. So as we continue on through this, that was the first step. So now we want to do basically the initial oxidation, the lithography mask for it, and then a etch. So going on to the oxidation part, we're going to use the Tryon Minilock PCVD. And what you see already is that I already loaded up all of the parameters you need from the Tryon PCV. I have the mode of type of deposition, you have the pre depth time, you have the deposition time, the corresponding clean time, you can enter in the deposition thickness that you expect. But this is not all required. This is all basically fill-in data that you can choose or to use or not to use. 
and all the gas flows are already there. So Patrick, are you creating a new data set under the collection that you just created? Yes. So I'm still using the EC444 transistor IC. As the collection. And then yes. You create a new data set. And then you create a new data set under that. So basically, whatever new data set that I create here ends up uh, in the collection of EC444. So you can think of these just as folder hierarchies. So once you're there, you can go ahead and name your data set. And again, you can enter in the uh, different parameters. So I'm just going to fill in a couple of parameters here. But like I said, again, you don't necessarily need to fill all these out just in case uh, there's some values that you don't particularly are too interested in this experiment, or there's just some that you feel like um, aren't actually applicable or aren't used at all. So say if I'm not using silent and I don't really want it, I can just go ahead and remove it. And then you can fill out the rest of your data here in a very easy fashion that allows you to then create that next fabrication step along with any images that you want to upload. And you can just basically go rapid pace at this point um, because once you're in this stage, you can just keep on cl uh, clicking create new data set to go through the rest of it. So once you have your oxidation, you can say, oh, well, I want to go to lithography. Maybe it's one stage. Maybe you want image reversal. So that has that extra flood uh, exposure there. But for us, this is only a one stage. And you can, again, alter all the parameters that you need and then create save. So this is all stuff that Yes, this is data that basically if you write down in your notebook, you would go down to a computer and then you just punch these in really quick just so all the data is digitalized and saved. So, my, so I'm not trying to convince you guys to completely ditch the notebook uh, if, you, if that's not how you guys want to do it. But an easy way to do it is basically how I've been doing it is I keep a notebook with me, write down my parameters while I'm doing the experiment. Once I get back to my desk, all I have to do, or if I'm just you know waiting on my tool to clean and I have 10 minutes to waste, I basically go on 4c.illinois.edu, punch in my data uh, experiments for the day. So basically I have two, cop two working copies of my data, one that's digitalized and one that is in a clean room notebook fashion. Yep. Um, the bracelet side of this, the 4C project is hopefully we were, are going to have all of the older machines, the XP and older, being able to access this through a safe um, cloudlet, as we call it, like the intermediary, that the tools themselves through a web browser will be able to get to essentially this interface, but in a protected fashion that does not bring any vulnerabilities back to the uh, endpoints, the actual Windows XP machines. But our, our goal is to have all of the machines that have a browser able to get to this so you can upload some of this stuff straight from the tool while you're running. That's not in production just yet, but we're working on that part now. Sorry. No, it's fine. So hopefully uh, within the next year or so with the development of Bracelet, um, 4C will actually just be a little thumb widget uh, basically on the tools. So possibly some of the tools such as maybe the STS PCVD that actually has a computer interface. For those such as the Plasma Lab Free on RAE, that's a more difficult thing to do just because it doesn't have a computer interface. But we envision basically having um, all of the, a little widget on the computer that's able to upload into 4 -seed. So once you're done with it, your experiment, it will probably save all of your uh, data parameters in there and already upload that data into your 4 -seed account so you can see it. I believe uh, MIT already has something like this uh, already implemented where all of their users get basically a receipt of their process and tools. So basically we're trying to replicate that through using a 4 seed cloud storage base. So once you're done doing your lithography mask and you can uh, save it, you can again just use onto the Oxford Freon ICPRE to basically define your oxide.
with the uh, values already loaded. Now this is just basically a cleaning recipe, but you can alter the values as such needed to basically match what your recipe does. And you can do this for uh, basically uh, steps that are more um, intricate almost. So you can do this for any type of process as long as basically you can uh, put it into a parameter type format. And what you should have afterwards And what you basically end up having is something that looks like this. So once you have basically your uh, recipe already loaded up with the optical image, anyone can come and look at your uh, recipe or fabrication flow and they immediately know what the overall uh, structure looks like. Basically, here are the steps that I go take and here are the following images with it. So they have a visual view of your step-by-step -step process. And if they want to go into basically to look at what your process parameter is, all they have to do is look at the metadata that can also be altered. So say if you're still just using a running uh, collection for a device process and you keep on changing it. If I want to say I want to lower my spin speed to 2000, There it is. If I want to upload my spin speed to 2000, all I can do is go in there and edit and change it really quickly, and that's already uh, broadcasted to all the group members who can access this space. So again, this makes it very easy for people who use, uh, who constantly update their X recipes or lithography recipes and share group Y to be commonly used. And not only that, but they can see and upload it, say that um, your X recipe was updated and has a better profile. You can actually upload that profile as a thumbnail image so they can look at the parameter while looking at the resulting profile. So maybe if that profile doesn't fit a group member's application, then they already know that beforehand instead of just knowing this is supposed to be a better X recipe. So again, 4Seed helps facilitate all of this and it's just going to get bigger and better as uh, we go on with improving uh, the development and getting more users on board. Um, ultimately, we're trying to have a kind of uh, machine learning algorithm added onto it where basically we can uh, search different, basically if you have a data type in 4 it would actually match with different publications on the web. So basically this would be a correspondence between something about like Google Scholars and your data. So if you have diffusion experiment and it has like impurity induced pixels, then uh, it would have a 4 seed suggestion that pulls up papers of impurity induced pixels. And that's what we imagine 4 seed to become within the next couple of years as we get more user data and as uh, development continues on. So as that kind of concludes my talk, I kind of want to ask for uh, questions or feedback while you guys kind of get lunch here because I know I've been keeping you guys for a couple of whiles. <laughs>